This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 19. Is Anarchism Violence? You have heard that anarchists throw bombs, that they believe in violence, and that anarchy means disorder and chaos. It is not surprising that you should think so. The press, the pulpit, and everyone in authority constantly din it into your ears. But most of them know better, even if they have a reason for not telling you the truth. It is time that you should hear it. I mean to speak to you honestly and frankly, and you can take my word for it, because it happens that I am just one of those anarchists who are pointed out as men of violence and destruction. I ought to know, and I have nothing to hide. Now, does anarchy really mean disorder and violence, you wonder? No, my friend. It is capitalism and the government which stands for disorder and violence. Anarchism is the very reverse of it. It means order without government and peace without violence. But is that possible, you ask? That is just what we're going to talk over now. But first, your friend demands to know whether the anarchists have never thrown bombs or have ever used any violence. Yes, anarchists have thrown bombs and have sometimes resorted to violence. There you are, your friend exclaims. I thought so. But do not let us be hasty. If anarchists have sometimes employed violence, does it necessarily mean that anarchism means violence? Ask yourself this question, and try to answer it honestly. When a citizen puts on a soldier's uniform, he may have to throw bombs and use violence. Will you say then that citizenship stands for bombs and violence? You will indignantly resent the imputation. It simply means you will reply that under certain, certain circumstances, a man may have to resort to violence. The man may happen to be a Democrat, a monarchist, a socialist, a Bolshevist, or an anarchist. You will find that this applies to all men at all times. Brutus killed Caesar because he feared his friend meant to betray the Republic and become king. Not that Brutus loved Caesar less, but that he loved Rome more. Brutus was not an anarchist, he was a loyal Republican. William Tell, as folklore tells us, shot to death the tyrant in order to rid his country of oppression. Tell never had heard of anarchism. I mention these instances to illustrate the fact that that from time immemorial, despots met their fate at the hands of outraged lovers of liberty. Such men were rebels against tyranny. They were generally patriots, democrats or republicans, occasionally socialists or anarchists. Their acts were cases of individual rebellion against wrong and injustice. Anarchism had nothing to do with it. There was a time in ancient Greece when killing a despot was considered the highest virtue. Modern law condemns such acts, but human feeling seems to have remained the same in this matter as in the old days. The conscience of the world does not feel outright, outraged by tyrannicide. Even if publicly not approved, the heart of mankind condones and often even secretly rejoices in such, such acts. Were there not thousands of patriotic youths in America willing to assassinate the German Kaiser, whom they held responsible for starting the world war? Did not a French court recently acquit a man who killed Petlura to avenge the thousands of men, women, and children murdered in the Petlura pogroms against the Jews of South Russia? In every land, in all ages, there have been tyrannicides, that is, men and women who loved their country well enough to sacrifice even their own lives for it. Usually, they were persons of no political party or idea, but simply haters of tyranny. Occasionally, they were religious fanatics, like the devout Catholic Coleman, who tried to assassinate Bismarck, or the misguided enthusiast Charlotte Corday, who killed Marat during the French Revolution. In the United States, three presidents were killed by such individual acts. Lincoln was shot in 1865 by John Wilkes Booth, who was a Southern Democrat. Garfield in 1881 by Charles Jules Gutierrez, a Republican, and McKinley in 1901 
by Leon Solzhals. Out of the three, only one was an anarchist. The country that has the worst oppressors also produces the greatest number of tyrannicides, which is natural. Take Russia, for, for instance. With complete suppression of speech and press under the czars, there was no way of mitigating the despotic regime other than by putting the fear of God into the tyrant's heart. Those avengers were mostly sons and daughters of the highest nobility, idealistic youths who loved liberty and the people. With all other avenues closed, they felt themselves compelled to resort to the pistol and dynamite in the hopes of alleviating the miserable conditions of their country. They were known as nihilists and terror terrorists. They were not anarchists. In modern times, individual acts of political violence have been even more frequent than in the past. The women suffer suffragettes in England, for example, frequently resort to it to propagate and carry out their demands for equal rights. In Germany, since the war, men of the most conservative political views have used such methods in the hope of re-establishing the kingdom. It was a monarchist who killed Karl Erzberger, the Prussian Minister of Finance, and Walter Rathenau, Minister of Foreign Affairs, was also laid low by a man in the same political party. Why the original cause of, or at least the excuse for, the Great War itself was the killing of an Austrian heir to the throne by a Serbian patriot who had never heard of anarchism. In Germany, Hungary, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and in every other European country, men of the most varied political views have resorted to acts of violence, not to speak of the wholesale political terror practiced by organized bodies such as the fascists in Italy, the Ku Klux Klan in America, or the Catholic Church in Mexico. You see then that anarchists have no monopoly on political violence. The number of such acts by anarchists is infinitesimal as compared to those committed by persons of other political persuasions. The truth is in that every country, in every social movement, Violence has been a part of the struggle from time immemorial. Even the Nazarene, who came out to preach the gospel of peace, resorted to violence to drive the money changers out of the temple. As I have said, anarchists have no monopoly on violence. On the contrary, the teachings of anarchism are those of peace and harmony, of non-invasion, of the sacredness of life and liberty. But anarchists are human, like the rest of mankind and perhaps more so. They are more sensitive to wrong and injustice, quicker to resent oppression, and therefore not exempt from occasionally voicing their protest by an act of violence. But such acts are an expression of individual temperament and not of any political theory. You might ask whether the holding of revolutionary ideas would not naturally influence a person towards deeds of violence. I do not think so because we have seen that violent methods are also employed by people of the most conservative opinions. If persons of directly opposite political views commit similar acts, it is hardly reasonable to say that their ideas are responsible for such acts. Like results have a like cause, but that cause is not to be found in political convictions, rather in individual temperament and the general feeling about violence. You might be right about temperament, you say, I can see that revolutionary ideas are not the cause of political acts of violence, else every revolutionist would be committing such acts. But do not such views to some extent justify those who commit such acts? It may seem so at first sight, but if you think it over, you will find that it is an entirely wrong idea. The best proof of it is that anarchists who hold exactly the same views about government and the necessity of abolishing it, often disagree entirely on the question of violence. Thus, Tolstoyan anarchists, and most individual anarchists, condemn political violence, while other anarchists approve or at least justify it. Is it reasonable then to say that anarchist views are responsible for violence, or in any way influence such acts? Moreover, many anarchists, who at one time believed in violence as a means of propaganda have changed their opinion about it and do not favor such methods anymore. There was a time, for instance, when anarchists advocated 
individual acts of violence, known as propaganda by deed. They did not expect to change government and capitalism into anarchism by such acts, nor did they think that the taking off of a despot would abolish despotism. No, terrorism was considered a means of avenging a popular wrong, inspiring fear in the enemy, and also calling attention to the evil against which the act of terror was directed. But most anarchists today do not believe any more in the propaganda of the deed, and do not favor acts of that nature. Experience has taught them that though such methods may have been justified and useful in the past, modern conditions of life make them unnecessary and even harmful to the spread of their ideas. But their ideas remain the same, which means that it was not anarchism which shaped their attitude to violence. It proves that it is not certain ideas or isms that lead to violence, but that some other causes bring it about. We must therefore look elsewhere to find the right explanation. As we have seen, acts of political violence have been committed not only by anarchists, socialists, and revolutions of all kinds, but also by patriots, nationalists, by democrats and republicans, by suffragettes, by conservatives, and reactionaries, by monarchists and royalists, and even by religionists and devout Christians. We know that it could not have been any particular idea or ism that influenced their acts, because the most varied ideas and isms produced similar deeds. I have given as the reason individual temperament and the general feeling about violence. Here is the crux of the matter. What is the general feeling about violence? If we can answer this question correctly, the whole matter will be clear to us. If we speak honestly, we must admit that everyone believes in violence and practice it however he may condemn it in others. In fact, all of the institutions we support and the entire life of present day society are based on violence. What is the thing we call government? Is it anything else but organized violence? The law orders you to do this or not to do that, and if you fail to obey, it will compel you by force. We are not discussing just now whether or not it is right or wrong, whether it should or should not be so. Just now, we are interested in the fact that it is so, that all government, all law, and authority rest on force and violence, on punishment or the fear of punishment. Even spiritual authority, the authority of the church and God rests on force and violence, because it is the fear of the divine wrath and vengeance that wields power over you, compels you to obey, and even to believe against your own reason. Wherever you turn, you will find that our entire life is built on violence or the fear of it. From earliest childhood, you are subjected to the violence of your parents or elders. At home, in school, in the office, factory, field, or shop, it is always someone's authority which keeps you obedient and compels you to do his will. The right to compel you is called authority. Fear of punishment has been made into duty and is called obedience. In this atmosphere of force and violence, of authority and obedience, of duty, fear and punishment, we all grow up. We breathe it throughout our lives. We are so steeped in the spirit of violence, we never ask whether violence is right or wrong. We only la ask whether it is legal, whether the law permits it. You don't question the right of the government to kill, to confiscate and imprison. If a private person should be guilty of the things the government is doing all the time, you'd brand him a murderer, a thief, and a scoundrel. But as long as the violence committed is lawful, you approve of it and submit to it. So it is not really violence that you object to, but to people using violence unlawfully. This lawful violence and fear of it dominate our whole existence, individual and collective. Authority controls our lives from the cradle to the grave. Authority parental, priestly and divine, political, economic, social and moral. But whatever the character of that authority, it is always the same executioner wielding power over you through your fear of punishment in one form or another. You are afraid of God and the devil, of the priest and your neighbor, of your employer and your boss, of the politician and the policeman, 
of the judge and the jailer, of the law and government. All your life is a long chain of fears, fears which bruise your body and lacerate your soul. On those fears is based the authority of God, of the church, of parents, of the capitalist and ruler. Look into your heart and see if what I say is not true. Why, even among children, the ten-year-old Johnny bosses his younger brother or sister by the authority of his greater physical strength, just as Johnny's father bosses him by his superior strength and by Johnny's dependence upon his support. You stand for the authority of priest and preacher because you think they can call down the wrath of God upon your head. You submit to the domination of your boss, judge, and government because of the power to deprive you of your work, to ruin your business, to put you in prison, a power, by the way, that you yourself have given into their hands. So authority rules your whole life, the authority of the past and the present, of the dead and the living, and your existence is a continuous invasion and violation of yourself, a constant subjugation to the thoughts and the will of someone else. And as you are invaded and violated, you subconsciously revenge yourself by invading and violating others over whom you have authority or can exercise compulsion, physical or moral. In this way, all life has become a crazy quilt of authority, of domination and submission, of command and obedience of coercion and subjection, of rulers and ruled, of violence and force in a thousand and one forms. Can you wonder that even idealists are still held in the meshes of this spirit, of authority and violence, and are often impelled by their feelings and environment to invasive acts entirely at variance with their ideas? We are all still barbarians who resort to force and violence to settle our doubts, difficulties, and troubles. Violence is the method of ignorance, the weapon of the weak. The strong of heart and brain need no violence, for they are irresistible in their consciousness of being right. The further we get away from primitive man and that hatchet age, the less recourse we shall have to force and violence. The more enlightened man will become, the less he will employ compulsion and coercion, the really civilized man will divest himself of all fear and authority. He will rise from the dust and stand erect. He will bow to no czar, either in heaven or on earth. He will become fully human when he will scorn to rule and refuse to be ruled. He will be truly free only when there shall be no more masters. Anarchism is the ideal of such a condition, of a society without force and compulsion, where all men shall be equals, and live in peace, freedom, and harmony. The word anarchy comes from the Greek, meaning without force, without violence, or government, because government is the very fountainhead of violence, constraint, and coercion. Anarchy, therefore, does not mean disorder and chaos, as you had thought before. On the contrary, it is the very reverse of it. It means no government, which is freedom and liberty. Disorder is the child of authority and compulsion. Liberty is the mother of order. A beautiful idea, you say, but only angels are fit for it. Let us see, then, if we can grow the wings we need for the ideal state of society. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.